This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy, episode 438 for October 11th of 2018. Pushing performance to the edge with the 2019 Ford Edge ST. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Today's show is coming to you from the middle of Utah. We're in Soldier Hollow, Utah, just outside of Park City. The reason that we're here is this is the place that Ford has chosen to launch the Ford Edge, but more specifically, the Ford Edge ST. And this is all about performance. We'll be hearing from one of the engineers who developed the vehicle, also from one of the marketing people to tell us how they're going to sell it, and we're going to get going right after this. We are looking at the beautiful Wasak Mountains out there in Utah right now, and we get a chance to do a brand new show. Gary Vasilash is not here today. He's out, I think, on vacation. So I've got Nick Miles from OurAutoExpert.com riding shotgun with me. And Nick, it's great to have you on yeah, board. Yeah, thanks for asking me. Yeah. We also have Ed Krenz, the Ford Performance Chief Functional Engineer, joining us. And Ed, great having you on. Oh, Auto very excited to be hours. here. Very excited. So let's start talking about the, the new Edge ST. Uh, what'd they tell you to do? I mean, they must have come to you and said, Ed, go turn this thing into an ST, or what was the idea behind what you've done with the vehicle? Yeah, the, obviously we know what an ST is within Ford Performance, right? And we, we understand the importance of the, uh, the SUVs, uh, the segment, and, and, and to our business. Um, so we, we, we knew we had the recipe, and we had the base vehicle, and the process was to apply that recipe to the vehicle. Um, we call it DNA, right? And our DNA uh, is intended to drive uh, consistency and credibility. And uh, the consistency is across the ST brands, right? We have a very loyal uh, customer. Uh, and the credibility is, is, is to the marketplace, right? The, the vehicle has to, to perform and meet expectations. Uh, both of our existing customers and about all the new customers that the SUV brings to us. And that was really, um, that's really the opportunity here is to, is to bring an ST to a much broader, uh, broader market. So for us, it was about, we know what it is. We have the recipe, the DNA, um, and this vehicle was more than capable uh, as a start point. And it was exciting to bring this to, uh, bring it to market for you guys to evaluate. You've, in the past, just throwing a turbo on an engine, put on some grippier tires and called it a day. It sounds to me like you, from what you're saying there, you went into a lot more detail on this. Yeah, we, we really focused on, on four things from a Ford performance perspective. Uh, first, it has to be absolutely fun to drive. Um, and, you know, we're talking about out on the twisties, right? Certainly we do some, some track testing on all of our STs, but it's really intended when you get up in these mountains uh, to be a blast to drive, right? So fun to drive. It has to... F- performance feel everything from acceleration to how it sounds um, it has to have uh, the unmistakable ST appearance right you need to know walking up to the vehicle that you recognize it even if there isn't a badge on it right and I think we've done that with with the uh, the front honeycomb grill um, the, the wheels uh, the interior uh, appointments um, I think we've accomplished that so yeah, and uh, so very proud. And then sustained capability is the fourth thing. Um, sustained capability means it's not good enough just to go really fast for a second. All right? Um, all of our STs have to have sustained uh, track capability, and that's what drives us to uh, uh, bigger rotors and, and uh, for brake uh, capability. It's what drives us to uh, extra coolers, uh, front end opening, right? Uh, to get extra cooling. So that's all about sustained capability, right? The customer needs to have that capability uh, all the time. I noticed something in what you said there. You said track capability. Yeah. 
and, and that means presumably that this car is track worthy and constantly being able to be used on the track rather than just some spirited driving. Uh, it is, is part of our, our process within Ford Performance. We, as part of the development process of this vehicle, we spend time at tracks. Uh, the same people that tune our uh, Shelby's uh, RS's, ST's were in this vehicle uh, setting up the chassis. Uh, and absolutely, it has to have the sustained capability. So it's, it's not afraid of a track. Oh, my next question is, when do we get to track it? Uh, I, believe, uh, I believe that's in a couple hours right, right outside the door. <laughs> uh, and there'll be a time-based test, and uh, we'll see how you guys do. That'll be fun to do. Let's talk about some of the tracks. You, you talk, took it to the, the Nordschleife at uh, the Nürburgring in Germany. Uh, we've taken various products to those tracks. This one was uh, tried and tested at uh, Groton. In, in Michigan. Yep. Yep. What, what do you get out of taking it to the track as opposed to just driving it out on the road? Right. So uh, from, a, from a development perspective... And that's what I'm asking. I mean, as, an, as yeah. enthusiasts, we all love to go to the track. But I'm thinking from a, from a development engineer standpoint, what are you learning at the track? Yeah, so, so what it is, we envision the majority of our customers are out here on these twisties, on these mountain roads. Um, as we're developing a vehicle... Uh, our engineers need to push the vehicles to the limits, and in some, ki- in some cases, beyond the limits. That may not be the best environment to find where that limit is and exceed it, right? So the track for us is a very uh, controlled, uh, repeatable, uh, safe place to go do development work where you can push the vehicle to and past its limits and understand really you know, what, what that looks like. And, and then we transfer that into, into the real-world driving uh, that we think most of these customers are going to use. I mean, for me, I'm, in a sense, too, is, is performance somewhat redundant for the consumer? Because like off-roading, everybody wants to know that their SUV can cope with some rough off-roading, not just a campsite road, but really some ruts and some mud and those type of things. Everybody wants to know that their Ford ST can actually cope with track and do the autocross in under 1 minute 30 seconds. But the truth is, are consumers actually going to use it that way? So... Um, I think it's important that the vehicles have the capability to be used that way, right? Um, will will they be? Will all customers be operating at the at the limit of the vehicle? No, of course not. But but that isn't necessary to get the experience, the performance feel experience, right? Straight line, red light or green light, the red light accelerations, um, the sport mode. Uh, capability with the aggressive shift schedule and uh, rev matching. Uh, all those things are, are something that the customer can appreciate as being a uh, performance quality uh, without necessarily being at the track. Well, let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of the thing. Let's start with the engine, the heart of the vehicle. What do you've got under the hood? What kind of power is it making? Yeah, so we have the uh, 2.7 liter twin turbo, uh, unique uh, in the ST for Edge. Unique in which way? It is. It is uh, the V6 is only offered in the ST, so it's it is a specific engine for the Edge product. Uh, 335 horsepower, so it's a unique tune off uh, versus other applications of, of this of this motor in other vehicles. And how'd you get that extra power? Uh, it's done predominantly through uh, some calibration and tuning. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the. Uh, the performance feel of that powertrain, right? That's it's the heart of of that DNA element to us is is that motor, right? It's it's what enables everything else to happen. You know, a lot of uh, companies brag about how uh, flat their torque curve is, or even their their horsepower curve, generating it at low RPM. If this is a track ready vehicle, I got to believe that you've tuned it more to the higher rev range. Well, the the the. Uh, the turbo, uh, the twin turbo, has a very uh, generous torque curve. Uh, you, you don't need to be in the uh, high uh, RPM bands for that. Uh, but certainly, the power, uh, the power is available to the uh, up to the uh, up to the rev limits, of course. I noticed with uh, with the competition for this vehicle, your competition was very um, luxury car based, very German. Yeah luxury car base and and Italian luxury car base so there isn't really competition in this size class for this vehicle but one of those things the things that they have is when they buy turbos or their twin turbos is they some of those competitive cars from Audi or from BMW have some horrible turbo lag you manage to extinguish that pretty much and especially in sport mode when I'm punching this vehicle I'm not have to having to count one one thousand two one thousand until the acceleration kicks in it's pretty instantaneous, so you seem to have managed to negate some of that turbo lag. Yeah, that's 
it gets to the performance feel of a vehicle, and it's very much integrated with the transmission and, and the uh, and the shift schedules. And we have the the all new eight speed transmission that's mated with this uh, with this two point seven liter, uh, and it's really a, it's a systems uh, between the software, the calibration, it's the immediacy of the response of the pedal. It's something we always strive for and have uh, definite criteria for uh, to achieve from a performance perspective. Yeah, in fact, Mac Murphy, who watches the show, wrote in to say what. What kind of transmission? You just answered that eight-speed automatic. Is that one that Ford makes, or is, are you buying this one? Uh, absolutely, it's a Ford uh, Ford manufactured uh, transmission, and it'll be uh, you'll see its application across multiple uh, multiple vehicles moving forward. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, in the shift point, I noticed the shift points in when you put it into sport. Uh, that transmission is completely retuned. It holds those gears for a long time. Like, I, I mean, driving some of the twisties that we drove yesterday up through the mountain roads here in Utah, there were some significant segments in which I needed those lower gears, but it seems to hold on to it for a very long, like noticeably holding on to those gears. Yeah, so, so the vision of success for the, the sport mode uh, shift schedule is when you're in these twisties and you don't get an unwanted upshift. And the last thing you want to do is upshift, right, as you're coming into or in a, a twisty, right? So the, the goal, the vision of success is to hold that gear through the twisty. Uh, you know, so we look at things like uh, steering wheel inputs and all those type of things in terms of the shift schedule. Uh, but um, I'm glad the experience matched our, uh, our expectations. That's exactly the goal. And I, I haven't driven it like Nick has. I, I, I'll <laughs> be doing that later today yet. But... Uh, uh, Make me sound like I've, <laughs> I've done something wrong. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, uh, you've had a chance to drive it. I really have not. So I'll, I'll do that later today yet. It, it's an all-wheel drive system? It is uh, all-wheel drive, absolutely. And did you c- calibrate the, uh, the balance between that for more performance? It's, uh, we have the capability for 50-50% uh, percent, uh, torque front to rear. Uh, we think that's optimal for uh, for the purpose of traction, you know, using the tires we have. I think one of the things I've always noticed with these vehicles that you, uh, once you get into the performance region of SUVs, the, your fuel economy just plows. I mean, it just drops completely off the chart. But you you still manage to get sort of 28 miles a gallon um, out of the regular ST. I mean, you're, you're doing pretty pretty well with getting good mile a gallon out of these vehicles or I think it's 28 miles again it might be for the regular but the the fuel economy doesn't plummet once you get into the ST that was my point yeah and and as you walk from the prior uh, prior edition of the Edge Sport for example uh, we actually with all the performance that we're providing and all the capability that we're providing with an ST we actually do it with an improved fuel economy label and that's always one of our goals uh, within the performance vehicles is, is to, uh, to not compromise fuel. And you've seen that on other products like Raptors where we walked from, uh, walked from the first generation to the second generation with a 35% fuel economy improvement. It's, it's always the, the challenge to our team to provide performance. That's gotta be a uh, huge challenge. What, what were some of the key enablers that allowed you to get a decent MPG rating? Uh, certainly you look at things like Aero. Uh, the transmission is a big part of that, right? With the eight speeds versus the, uh, the prior version architecture. Uh, what was that? A six-speed? It was a six-speed, right? So it really gives you enough gears where you keep that engine uh, humming in the uh, in the sweet spot from a fuel perspective. Mm-hmm. Let's talk suspension. What changes did you make to that to make this thing yeah. trackable? Yeah. So fun to drive is all about suspension, isn't it? Uh, so yeah. So the springs. Uh, we start with the springs, right? We have a fifteen percent stiffer, roughly, on the front, twenty percent uh, on the on the rear. Monotube shocks. Um, and a uh, significant increase in the bar stiffness. So we get uh, about 60% uh, stiffer from a, a roll perspective. Uh, the whole point of that is uh, in combination with our, our seat, right, which is you're not something you normally think of as part of the uh, suspension, but the whole point is to keep you planted, right? And the primary ride control, I think, as, you, as you're going through the cornering and, and uh, ups and downs, right, we keep you planted. Uh, the seat keeps you in front of the steering wheel, and it all comes together for a, a real fun to drive. And it was the bolstering in the seat that, yeah, uh, that was critical to that? Yeah, the bolstering, uh, relatively aggressive bolstering uh, in both the lateral and in the cushion. Uh, the whole point of that is uh, you're going to be driving this thing quick around the turns. We don't want you falling into the door. So, uh, yeah, we'll, well keep you, a, keep you a, planted. A seat of the pants feel starts in the seat, doesn't That's it? That's right, absolutely. Seats are very important to our products. Mm-hmm. One of the losses I think I always find with uh, performance vehicles is that you know, the stiffer you make the suspension and, and the more race worthy you make it, the general drive starts to sort of lose some comfort. I mean, you seem to maintain that, even a freeway drive. I've been driving in this morning with you, John, 
you know, it was a comfortable ride. It didn't mm -hmm. feel like, you it's know, not although jarring. We were, yeah, right. and, and although we were in, we were in the uh, we went in the ST this morning, but even on the freeways yesterday, it you know, I don't feel uncomfortable yet. You managed to sustain a really top suspension on some of those twisters. Yeah, and the, and the secondary ride and the uh, um, what a lot of our customers are going to feel on a, on a daily basis uh, is, is absolutely something you, you can't. You try not to compromise on what, these vehicles. What do you mean by secondary ride? Yeah, so that would be uh, um, harshness, for example, uh, impacts, um, those type of uh, drive events. Uh, Michigan roads, for example, it's it's everything from potholes to frost heaves, right? It it, it needs to be a very drivable vehicle, um, and we it's always a goal to maintain that capability while while improving the primary ride and body control. One of the things that induces confidence in people, too, are the brakes. You must have done a lot with them as well. Yeah, absolutely. One of our key criteria uh, around sustained performance is, is, the, uh, is the brake fade. Uh, and what, what we mean by fade is uh, as the brakes will get, get hot, uh, ultimately they'll lose uh, capability. And, and our goal is that we can run our track sessions without having any loss in capability. Uh, so what you'll see on, this, on the ST vehicle is a uh, unique rotor uh, design, uh, materials, cooling, uh, and larger rotors on the rear of the vehicle uh, in combination with uh, unique performance brake pads um, to give this vehicle all the, all the stopping capability on a sustained basis that it needs. Mm -hmm. I've had an awful lot of like increase this and you know increase that bigger rate. Does the weight get heavier? Because that's obviously doesn't work with the fuel economy. Because the heavier you make the vehicle, of course, you get you're sucking more gas. Yeah. So um, we look at it from a power to weight perspective, and uh, certainly we with the 2.7 liter engine, we've more than offset from a power to weight perspective uh, the increased weight that you may see with coolers and and brake components. Uh, it's very critical to us to, to, to manage weight. Uh, any performance vehicle weights the enemy, um, and we try to minimize that. And, and we don't add content to the vehicle that doesn't help it uh, perform. Let's talk steering, too, because, I mean, that's the feel that you get right from the get-go in the car. What would you do with the steering? Yeah, so a couple elements of steering, right? It, it certainly has a, uh, a, faster, um, a faster responsiveness. Um, different torque buildup, right, so a better steering feel. And then the tires play a very important role in that, that steering feel uh, uh, on center feel, right? And you'll notice a, a very responsive uh, to small inputs, and that has a lot to do with our tires. And at the very beginning, you, you talked about exhaust note as well. What did you do in that regard to make this really f just sound like a performance vehicle? Yeah, so the, the 2.7 liter brings its own, uh, own sound character, and all, all we had to do is enhance it. So we have a unique cold-end exhaust on this vehicle, dual exhaust. Um, sounds excellent. Um, and then there is some electronic enhancement as you go into sport mode to give it just more, more brightness. Mm -hmm. Did you not think about putting an exhaust button in like the Mustang? Uh, I love the sound of starting that car in the morning. Yeah, you, uh, the, the Mustang uh, has its own uh, DNA, if you right. will, and uh, certainly that uh, specifically when you get into the performance back level twos and the active exhaust systems, that's a, uh, that's a next step. We've sort of gone through the whole car. What are we missing? Are you, what, what other part of the story is here about the ST? I think we've, we've covered it really well. Uh, I mean, we talked about the fun to drive aspect in our chassis setup enabled by a, a seat that really makes you feel planted. We've talked about the performance feel with the 2.7 liter engine, uh, eight speed transmission, uh, the exhaust and powertrain sound. Uh, we've talked about sustained capability with the uh, additional coolers and the brake, uh, brake redesign. Um, and we've talked about the appearance, right? And, and one key point on the appearance is, is really uh, form follows function. Uh, we don't do appearance for the sake of appearance. Um, we, we look at functionality, and that's one example of that is uh, the front end grill has a 40% increase in uh, cooling uh, airflow uh, to enable our cooling, right? So the grill looks outstanding, right? And it's very much part of the family that you put these STs together and say, yeah, that's an ST, and you know it right away. Uh, but it's, it's there for function as well. Everything we do is about the, 
about the function. When you design this vehicle, how much of the vehicle was designed by computers? Because I know from experience of going through the Ford factory, you spend a lot of your time allowing the computers to tell you how things should be and then sort of refining it. So uh, did you spend a lot of time with uh, CADs and CADs telling you that, that these things needed to be uh, a certain way to get the results that you were looking for? Yeah, we, we certainly have um, analytical capabilities um, all the way up into uh, we, we work very closely with our uh, motorsports team and use, have use of uh, simulators that allow us to do vehicle setups before we go out and actually evaluate them. Um, and when you get to specific component designs, whether it be shocks or exhaust systems, uh, they rely very heavily on analytical design methods. But when you bring the vehicle together, um, you can't replace actually going out and driving it. And, and you can do all the health charts and, and uh, PowerPoints you want about the analytical capability of the vehicle um, but the fact is you have to get into it and either you know you got it right or you didn't and we know we got it right. Computers help get you a, lo a long a way down point. the road but it's still going to be seat of the pants that gets you the final Absolutely. yard. That's okay. what you know if you got it right or not. Real good. Ed, we're going to have to wrap this up but Ed Krenz, thanks so much for coming on the show and walking us through the new Ford ST. Oh, Edge ST. Lots of fun. Thank you guys. Real Appreciate good. It. We're going to take a quick break and give a shout out to our great sponsor, Borg Warner. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. We create innovative mobility technologies that reduce energy consumption and emissions while improving performance. Our proven track record has made us an industry leader in forward-looking propulsion solutions for combustion, hybrid, and electric vehicles. We're back talking all about the Ford Edge ST with Nick Miles from OurAutoExpert.com. And joining us right now is Christina Aquino. She's the Ford Edge Marketing Manager, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I had a, a question for you, yes. Christina. One of the things I noticed in, in what used to happen with cars when they were released. So we'd have a, a vehicle release, which was the general consumer vehicle. And then towards the end of the life cycle, we'd start to see special editions. We'd start to see the STs. We'd start to see the black editions. But the, the fashion now is to come out with all flags flying and when you have a new version of the vehicle come out with the most spectacular performance halo version and so you've changed the trend of what used to be done when vehicles were released yeah absolutely i'm so excited that we're actually kicking off with the st um, it's a really great opportunity to show what Ford is really capable of doing, and it's tying into a lot of things that we know are happening with the transfer to SUVs. And so it made sense to say, hey, we've got a great product, and we're going to show you what we can do, combining all the technology, the drive, and the great-looking uh, aspects that people expect out of the Edge and packaging it up in the ST. What led to say, hey, we've got to do an ST version of the Edge? You know, um, I think back, at least the aha moment for me and the marketing job was I remember taking some folks out in the car, and this was back when we were just a sport, so it was some go, right? But when people felt the new platform that we had, and they were like, wow, this vehicle drives so beautifully, there's no reason a vehicle this big should drive this well. And I thought, you're right, and this isn't even the tip of the iceberg for what I know we can do. So we started having some conversations. What's the possibility? Where could we go? And as we explored it more, the ST seemed to make a lot of sense, a great opportunity to leverage all that knowledge that Ed obviously has right, on Ford Performance and bring it to this vehicle. There's actually, I think, the opportunity here to go much further because the ST is also sort of the beginning rung of your performance. So the, the, the blank sheet of paper exists, right, to if this works, if the consumer likes this vehicle, if it's exhilarating enough to, to have whatever your minimum sales targets are, then the possibility is you could think about making steps further in the future. Oh, I think there's a lot of opportunity. We're just testing the water right now to see what do people expect and want out of a performance SUV. And we'll explore that more through other vehicles in our showroom too. But I think I'm really excited to see what we can find out from this little Ford. And this is the, the first one, right? This is the first this SUV. Is the first SUV. And we know the there's another one team. coming. We know that yes. there's, yeah, there's yes. more we coming. We have announced that there's another one coming in our larger, my larger brother. 
Yeah, you've got uh, a real hardcore audience, mm -hmm. owner base, yes. with STs and Fiesta and Focus. Are they going to be the people coming into these cars, or who do you, are you going to bring in new buyers altogether? I think we're seeing a couple different groups that we're, we're really looking at. What you're referring to as uh, a group I call our Ford Performance grown-ups, if you will. So they're people who love performance, have a passion to drive, but their life is starting to get into the way, right? And I've met hundreds of these folks as I've gone out and done tours and gone to Daytona or whatever. They love to drive but they need an SUV. And so now they're managing a huge garage of vehicles. But this one can answer the question for both the love of performance and the need to haul people and things around. Um, I also think we're going to see a customer who, um, from talking to folks who were driving the Sport or driving the Edge in general, like, I love my car. Now that I've seen the ST, you know, spy shots or appeal shots, I didn't know I could want a car with this much performance, but they're starting to feel like an awakening inside them for real performance that they had sort of written off as a possibility for them. So I think we're going to get some of those folks as well. I think you've baked the cake, right? You've got the perfect cake. Mm -hmm. The Edge ST is, is perfect. Are you going to wave and shout and scream about this vehicle, or is it just going to be sort of quietly put in showrooms and see what happens? Well, we are actually, I mean, I think it's a little bit unique also as you're talking about how we're launching it. This is the feature vehicle in all of our advertising. We're pulling together a ton of really a great body of work from our TV Tier 1 and digital and everything to say, look at what we can do. Because in the end, the ST represents what the Edge has to offer. Great looking great technology, incredibly fun to drive, right? That's what people have expected from Edge since we launched it. We're just packaging it with a special feature edition of the ST. What about marketing to women? Because when you talk performance, all automakers and all their advertising, all their promotion, it's always to men. I think there's a huge opportunity of women who love performance but think, oh, maybe it's not the right image or whatever. I know, I think it's a very fascinating question why people don't think that women love performance, right? Um, why wouldn't we love power and engagement and feeling confident behind the wheel? We're absolutely going to deliver this with this vehicle. I think um, you'll definitely see an edge today, right? Our customer base is about 50, 55 percent women. I don't think that we'll necessarily be 55 percent women when it comes to the ST, but I think we're definitely going to see a large number of them come in. So if you think about Fiesta or Focus, they're more like 15 percent female buyers. But this enables a woman to have all the power and confidence they want in the vehicle, but still take care of their personal needs, their family needs, which I think is something that they we've seen from talking to them, they take into more consideration on the buying process. Will you have women in your ads? We do have women in our ads, actually. I yes. think that's almost about a first. <laughs> <laughs> Driving a performance vehicle? Yeah, right. Well, I'm happy to set that, to break that barrier then, because I think it makes, it makes complete sense. I think, our well, I know from when I was revealing the vehicle and talking to folks as we were preparing to bring this to market, that women really connected with the idea behind this. The, you know, we live in a massive country, you know, like 350 million people. I mean, there are 11 states in this country that are bigger than the whole of the UK, which is where I live. <laughs> Oregon is one of them. So we're living in a country that, that has completely different climates, completely different people. Mm -hmm. Where is the edge going to be most popular? You've made it all-wheel drive, which means above right. the Mason-Dixon line, right. it makes a lot of sense for those people to be able to drive it in Michigan weather, in, in Seattle weather. But then again, it's also the performance end. It's going to be great in places like Miami and California. Right. So where is the edge going to be most centric, or is it just an American car? Well... We will always perform well in the sunshine states. We definitely know that will be the case. I think some things that I found interesting as we're looking through some of the data is you'll see a lot of folks in New York. New York's kind of the utility you know, haven anyway. So a lot of folks who are really going to grasp onto this idea, and I think for some of their great roads up there, that would be fine. Um, interestingly, Denver performs really well for Edge today and Edge Sport today. So I think there's an opportunity there that I think will be really interesting, similar to where we are today in Utah, right? So great winding roads, but a real need for that all-wheel drive. And we've even done things like amped up the capability um, on the vehicle by having trailer tow on an ST, right? Like that's a really interesting combination. So we're meeting their needs, but also giving them extra performance. How are you going to market 
this as a performance vehicle. And what I get is, I'm getting at is, a lot of people are going to go, what, an SUV? That's not really a track vehicle. That, that's mm -hmm. not a performance vehicle. How are you going to break through that barrier and change people's image of it? Well, we, there are a bunch of things that we're trying to do. One, we're just getting the word out that it's out there. So we're really leveraging our, our, our tier one media to really tell that story. And we've partnered a lot with different influencers and folks to get them behind the wheel of the car. I mean, in the end, what's important is, well, how do you feel when you get behind the wheel and let, let it rip, right? And so we want to have folks who are credible in the performance space telling that story for us. Because I, I can tell you all day long, I'm a marketing manager, I have marketing in my title. If I tell you I've delivered a great performance vehicle, you'll smile and you'll nod, and then you're gonna say, okay, well, let's see what you can do. So we need those other people to help us tell that story. Do you see this vehicle being mostly, the story being mostly communicated via traditional media? Because you mentioned influencers there, but I mean, radio and television is still the core of marketing for, uh, for automotive. Or do you see it, the, the customer maybe learning about this vehicle in other ways? Well, I think that you're always going to have to start with a little bit of that mass awareness, especially when you're introducing a new series like the ST. Um, and then we're going to start leaning into other digital ways. We're going to work a little bit more with social media. We're absolutely going to get the dealers out there experiencing the vehicle as much as we can so they can become our sort of evangelists on the ground, if you will. We'll get our sales consultants behind it, and we'll be doing some more drive experiences um, that you'll be seeing later on next year when the weather gets a little better. I've noticed, <laughs> I've noticed that uh, a lot of times now car companies are doing experiences because mm -hmm. you can tell me about it on television an awful lot, but there's nothing like actually getting behind the wheel and driving the car. Exactly it's right. Like, we don't buy cars by, just by test driving, you know, through television, we actually go to a dealer and test drive them. So are those, those customer experiences becoming valuable, more valuable for you? I think they're hugely valuable because I think that they help. Um, people people will work off of word of mouth a lot, right? And so even if you don't end up buying the, the, the vehicle, if you feel like, oh, man, I drove an Edge ST and you would not believe it, okay. you're going to spark the interest of other folks, right? In a more credible way than I can ever do it for you. Can you do autocrosses and track time as part of that? Because, I, I mean, mean the, that's what's really going to cash the check when it comes to this vehicle. I think that that's a great way to bring it to market. I'm wondering about lifestyle, too, because I'd love to see a dog package for this vehicle as well. <laughs> I'd love to see dog gates and, you know, and, and those type of things. I think that's actually a really great idea. And that's one of those weird key insights that you get coming out of research that's kind of a no-brainer, but everyone's like, wow. Everyone comes in, they've got a dog. Well, so everyone's got a And they're becoming members of the family, right? 72% right. well, of Americans own dogs. You yeah, own my yeah, both. Yeah, yeah. So you're putting right. them in, I mean, I actually, I, I almost asked the question, do you want the dog cage behind the second row or behind the first row because the dogs are moving farther and farther up to the front of the car they because they're so connected. They want to look out the window. Right, exactly. <laughs> I was like, be close to I was like I think there's actually some design questions to ask you about what do we need to make our dogs happy because I feel like more and more customers are more worried about that sometimes than their kids. Oh, I, I am. <laughs> Christina, what are, one of the other things I, I think is uh, debuting with this vehicle is this new safety suite, which you guys are calling yes. uh, Copilot 360. Yes. Is this the first vehicle to get that? It is, and it's going to have it 100%. So we've been talking a lot about the ST, but you're going to see it all the way from our base SE all the way up. So we'll have Bliss, we'll have auto high beams, we'll have um, automatic emergency braking as part of our pre-collision assist package. Um, we have lane keeping systems standard on the edge, 100%, which is kind of amazing. So that really means that if you're starting to maybe you look like you're drifting out of your lane, the car vehicle's going to help nudge you in. So, you know, we know that people are facing an incredibly distracted world out there. This is designed to help them deal with those distractions. There's a lot of new buttons I notice in the car, too. I mean, so there's the sport button, which is in the middle of the shifter. Yes. Uh, that's, but you have some, some ESC buttons, and you have some other abilities with yes. the vehicle as well. Yeah, we have a bunch. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think one of the things that I really appreciate is, you know, for instance, we have an adaptive cruise control system, but you can set different levels of setting depending on your comfort. I mean, really, this is about making the, com the driver feel more confident and in control of the decisions they're making. So we've added all of this technology, but we're trying to also make it as user-friendly and customizable to your needs. Um, 
Alexa has been a huge part of your portfolio from now. Sync 3.0, you introduced uh, right. Alexa in the vehicle, so you could go from uh, home to car and car to home. Um, and now this vehicle presumably is giving us the latest generation of that home assistant, which we all may be begrudgingly, but we've all become to rely on much more in our lives. I walked into my hotel room this morning and I said, Alexa, turn the lights on. I was like, oh, I'm not at home. Oh, I know. It is embarrassing. I was like, who's going to tell me what the weather is right now? <laughs> so you, you've integrated it, this vehicle, the Integrated in this vehicle, absolutely. And I, yeah, so we want to make sure that we're really enabling people to bring their devices into just like you said, into your car, into your or into your experiences, right? It's the and same um, insight that we brought into when we first launched Sync, right? We know people are managing different devices. We want to make sure that it's as seamlessly integrated into their experiences in the car, just like it is in the rest of their and, life. And so I'm, I'm somebody who doesn't fully know all about this. Uh, <laughs> what's the difference between asking my phone in the car, Sync through Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, mm -hmm. to do things versus having Alexa in there? So now you're driving into a lot of things. So you're talking about, so we have all of those things, right? We have Android Auto, we have Apple CarPlay, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have Alexa, which all have their different components of how you can integrate and talk to a technology. So um, there are certain things that I think are really great. So if, for instance, you ask Alexa. Um, well, you can do uh, audio books with Alexa, right? You can do audio books with Alexa. Right, so you can ask Alexa yeah. to go to your Audible channel and play you. So, you know, no longer do you have to rely on the radio. Mm -hmm. You can use the Alexa that way. I, the one thing I love about uh, the, the Sync 3 with Alexa is the fact that I can open and close my garage door. Right. So as I'm coming home, I, I go, did I, Alexa, close the garage door, you know, just to make sure, did I close it mm -hmm. on the way out? Those, type, mm -hmm. those are the things that I find the most right. helpful. And then from the car to the home, home is being able to, you know, ask Alexa to do certain things with the car without leaving my house. Gotcha. Because, gotcha. you know, yeah, inherently yeah, yeah. I'm a lazy individual yeah. and that is, makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> you and me both. Or if you're a lazy individual and you forgot to buy toilet paper and you need some to ask Amazon to send it to you, you can shop from your car and say... Right, which is absolutely <laughs> horrifically dangerous. I'm it? on my way home. Shoot, I don't want to turn around. Well, I could get it in two days. Hey, we haven't talked about pricing. What, what's the price of the ST going to be? So the price of the SD will start right below $43,000, which I think, if you think about all of the technology that we're adding into the vehicle, plus all the drive experience, is amazing. Um, it's amazing And what's price. the walk up from uh, a regular Edge? So we'll start at twenty nine nine ninety five for for the Edge, and then you just kind of work your way up through the, through the chain. Starting price is always satisfying to know where it starts, but if I'm going to get... I can't leave a dealership without equipping my car. You know, I'd like to put all the options in, but price sometimes prohibits me in doing that. So a well-equipped Edge ST out of the dealership, mid I'd call 50s? it. I'd call it 52 to 53. The vehicles that we're going to be driving out here have a performance braking package and a bunch of other great stuff on it, which is amazing for delivering a true drive experience. I don't know that everyone's going to order that. I think they're really going to want... Um, well, they're going to want the 21-inch wheels, but they might not need the braking package. So I'd call it around 52, 53. The, the one thing I think I'm most excited about this, and I'm, I'm a bit of a techie geek, but the one thing I think I'm most excited about is, is your Wi-Fi. And that, and that allows you to connect up to 10 devices. Mm -hmm. Yet the car only seats five. <laughs> what? It's like cup holders, though, yeah. Nick. You, are you going to tell me that you only have one device that you no, bring with you No, but that means everybody car. in the car would have two. I'm sure everyone is wanting to buy their kids an iPad and a phone. Maybe they do. Uh, but you can I have also, two phones in my car, just me, right. myself. But you can also use it outside of the vehicle as well. Yeah, absolutely. Know, You've got a 50 that foot is an amazing feature. Yeah, yeah, 50 so feet. Yeah, exactly. You could set up your own campsite. Yeah, I mean, to me, I don't know any other car company that's doing a 50-foot radius in the Wi-Fi outside of the car, which means, you know, you can park it at a ball game or you could park it at a campsite and you mm -hmm. can use the Wi-Fi from the vehicle. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Oh, that's oh. a great feature. Okay, what are we missing here? What it, from the marketing story? Well, I think, I love that I think we've actually hit on everything because to me, the things that I love about Edge is how we've been able to wrap everything up in one package having really head-turning design. And we've got that on the ST, but we've also, behind us, we've got the Titanium Elite, which has, you know, where the ST leans into a little bit more aggressive. This is leaning into a little bit more elegant. So you really actually have some different faces of Edge that you can experience and enjoy. But all of it will always come with great, great looking, great technology, and everything's going to be fun to drive. It's just the ST is going to take it up a notch. When, when do they ship? So when can somebody go to a dealer and test drive? They're shipping now. All right. Good. Okay. There we go. 
Real good. Christina Aquino, thanks so much Thank for you so stopping much for by and talking about this thing. We're learning a lot here. Appreciate the opportunity. Real good. We're going to be back in a moment. Nick and I have got some ideas about what's going on in the industry from a new standpoint. But first, a shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone and Lear. To a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. Nick, here we are standing out in the sunshine with a couple of Ford Edges behind us. But I'm curious, what do you think? You know, we talked to Ed and Christina. Is this viable in your book? Yeah, I think so. I think the audience is still to be determined. But I think I always, and, and we're talking to you a little bit off camera, is I have an issue sometimes in just looking at it as a standalone piece of equipment, as the Edge ST, as a standalone vehicle. I, I translate it into language of potential market, what Ford is thinking, what the SUV market is doing. And I think there is many layers of this onion that need to be folded back. First of all, you've got a car which is doing exactly what they wanted it to do. It's a family vehicle that gives you just a little bit more, gives you a little bit more esteem, gives you a little bit more performance. What does it say about where Ford is going? I think this is the bottom tier of what they could do. If this vehicle sells the minimum amount uh, that they need to break even or to make it a viable uh, ROI situation, there is the opportunity to start stepping up to RSs and GTs, whichever they may decide to go. I mean, I wouldn't be ashamed to drive a 600 horsepower Edge. It's it's a possibility, and it gets me excited when I think about it. But I think as the package, package exists for $43,000, it's an excellent buy. I think the biggest problem is there's nothing to compare it to. Mm-hmm. Christina hinted that there's another SUV ST coming. Which one do you think it, it is? It is the. Um, I'm not sure how public the information is, but uh, I believe it is the uh, Explorer ST. Um, it's sort of the worst kept secret in the industry that it is coming, and it makes sense. We know a new Explorer is due at some point, a new one from the ground up. This is a highly important vehicle. The, the Edge is good and important for Ford, but the, the Explorer is the most important vehicle they have, and that being the SUV segment is the most important segment right now. And the reason why is it's not just a vehicle for families, but this is a utility American vehicle. So. Uh, Ford have the police market, you know, cornered basically with the Explorer. The new Explorer police edition, when it comes, will be amazing. There, if you look carefully, there are statistics online for that vehicle already. Uh, that that will be the next chapter in in Ford conquering uh, the United States SUV market. How far do they stretch this? Expedition, Echo Sport. Expedition doesn't, in my mind, warrant an ST version or a, it's just it's I mean it's based off the F-150 it would be more of a Raptor expedition version perhaps mm. uh, you could go that direction with it uh, you know if you get into the smaller Echo Sport perhaps but Echo Sport was designed as an eco vehicle from the ground up it was designed as a city vehicle once you start getting into performance in that I think you have to look at the vehicle's core value and the core value speaks to the edge and speaks to the Explorer once you get out of the the high volume cars and you get into much more of the fringe volume cars, I think the the mechanics, the finances, and the ROI makes less sense. I think Ford will be tempted, none, nonetheless, because as you know, if you do a performance derivative, you can charge more money. Yes, you're adding more equipment, but they always price it above whatever cost they're adding from the equipment standpoint. And if you're only going to sell X number of edges in this case, and you can say make 15% of that mix be STs, you've just increased the amount of revenue that you're going to bring in on that program. I think on the fringe, you could also do the Ford performance parts for these vehicles. So somebody could, instead of dedicating a factory line to making an ST version of the Expedition or something like that, you could, you could have the performance parts available. And so somebody could then actually go out and equip their personal uh, Expedition that way. So there, there is the ability to do it, but I'm not sure committing a factory line would make good financial sense. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by what you're saying of an RS or uh, RS version of this and maybe even a Raptor version of the Expedition. Uh, do you see something like that coming? Do you think that's part of Ford's plans? Yeah. I mean, look at, so let's look at the competition. The American competition is very strong between brands. Um, FCA have the Trackhawk. 
FCA have the Dodge Durango SRT. Those are a step above the performance levels of what they're doing here at Ford. And so it makes sense. If they can make a, a, an ROI, if they can make it make financial sense, you know Ford can do the same. Yeah, very interesting. And this is very much a logical and maybe a necessary move for Ford. I mean, as it's dumping most of its cars in the U.S. market, it's got to continue that performance line with the SUVs that it's keeping. Yeah, I mean, look, Ford doesn't make whimsical decisions. Their decisions are tested. They're true. It's a big company. They have a lot of people looking at this. They evaluate every move before they make it. There's a lot of jobs on the line. There's huge amounts of money, and there's huge volume on the line. Big American producer can't afford mistakes. More mistakes can be made in smaller companies like Fiat Chrysler, where they have smaller brands. They can afford to have something that isn't so much of a hit. Ford can't afford it. They're talking about uh, big projects in the next few years to lean up the company, to make everything more cost efficient, to make production more cost efficient, to make less waste, to make more ecological performance out of their factories. They're not going to make decisions here that don't make good business sense. You've had a chance to drive the Edge ST. Uh, I drove it from the airport to the hotel. That was in traffic, not much of an evaluation. What do you think? What are your first impressions of the vehicle? I really racked it. Like, I, I, I mean, I could smell the brakes by the time I was done. I really pushed this vehicle on some of those mountain roads. I squealed the back tires. I slid the back end out. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good car. They've got it right. They've done exactly what they should do. Um, my soul always tells me more power, more power, more power. But once I put myself in the shoes of a consumer and I'm understanding who's buying this and why they're buying it, I think they will be absolutely satisfied. I think the difficulty for me comes in... Who's buying the car? I need to understand the customer better because the average transaction price in the United States is around $35,000. This car starts at forty three, dollars So it's not just an average transaction vehicle. It's a little more. It's for somebody who can afford to branch out a little bit, to treat themselves, to give themselves a little bit of an emotional uplift. And so I need to understand who that is. This is not a mass volume car for everybody. It's for those people who want a spirited drive, who want to stand out from the neighbor and want to be somewhat unique. And I need to understand who that customer is to see if this car will be a success. Do you think Ford knows who that customer is yet? Yeah, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they're not going to share it either. That's the sort of data that they want to keep close to their chest. They want to monitor how this goes. Uh, again, this is not a company that makes whimsical decisions. They make very sure-footed decisions. If Ford makes a mistake, it wasn't a mistake because they knew what was going on. It was something they didn't expect to happen. They're a very sure-footed company. Mm -hmm. Real good, Nick. I want to thank you for your time today. This has been an interesting show. I really value your input, especially your insights on this vehicle, too. Yeah, thanks for having me along. It's been a great ride, and I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks much. And with that, we wrap up today's show. I want to thank you all for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires. Your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.